Thank you for joining us at Bay Ridge Christian Church and welcome to our Palm Sunday service. My name is Tony and I'm one of the elders here at BRCC. If you're new here, we're glad you could join us. Thanks for being here. And if you're a regular, well, thanks for your faithfulness. I'm going to pray and then Anne Bashur from our worship team will sing a few songs. And I hope you'll sing along with her. Let's worship our God, our Creator, and our Savior together today. Even if it does seem a little odd, we, we can't actually be together while we do it. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and, and ask that your spirit would be with us this morning as we praise and worship you and, and learn more about you. Lord, please let everyone listening to my voice today feel your loving and merciful presence. And before the end of it, Lord, please leave no heart unchanged. Father, I ask that this morning and for the rest of the week and beyond that we would experience you in a new way, a way that helps us to see you standing with us and stirs our gratitude and, and gives us faith to love you more fully, trust you more completely, and serve you more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's listen to some great music and worship along together. You have called us out of darkest night into your glorious light that we may see the wonders of the risen Christ. May our every breath retell the grace that broke into our strife. With boundless love and deepest joy, with endless life. May the peoples praise you, let the nations be glad. All your blessings come that we may praise. May praise the name of Jesus. All the earth is yours and all within each harvest is your own. And from your hand we give to you to make Christ known. May the seeds of mercy grow in us for those who have not heard. May songs of praise build lives of grace to spread your word. May the peoples praise you, let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. It's our holy privilege to declare your praises and your name to every nation, tribe, and tongue your church proclaims. May the peoples praise you, let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Good morning, church. The next song we're going to sing is new to our congregation. Um, it has played on the radio for a little while, but I just really felt the spirit laying it on my heart. It fits perfectly as we bridge from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday and really reflect on what this season means for us and the true miracle of the gospel and God's story and what he promised from the beginning. Um, so I, I truly hope this blesses you and I hope it leads you into worship. In the dark. 
darkness we were away without hope and without light till from heaven you came run there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Come, come, and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead arose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not heal and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Father turned his face away 
has wounds which mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Let's pray together. Father, how deep is your love for us? Lord, as we just sang, we recognize that we are in deep need of your love and your mercy towards us. Lord, we find ourselves so much like the crowds in Jerusalem that day that we, with our mouths, can be quick to praise you and then find ourselves in our hearts and in our actions turning away. But Father, we have hope because our salvation is not dependent upon us or our desires, but upon the fact that you are a God of mercy and compassion. Our salvation is not dependent upon our works, but upon the works of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is not dependent upon something that arises out of our spirit, but rather the work that your spirit has done in our hearts and souls. And so, Lord, we do praise you for your deep love and mercy and kindness that you have shown for us through Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we ask that by your spirit, you would continue to work in us that we might praise you with the words of our mouth, that we might serve you with the works of our hands, that our thoughts, words, and deeds would be pleasing to you, O oh our God, for you are worthy of everything we are, everything we have, and everything we ever could do. We thank you for all these things through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. Amen. Thanks to Ann Bayshore again for leading us in that singing and worship. We really appreciate it. And friends, I encourage you, as I do each week, for us to not just watch, but to worship together. At this time, what we're going to go ahead and do is pray for our missionaries. If you've ever been uh, with Bay Ridge before in our time of worship, you know that uh, most weeks we take time out to pray for one of our missionaries. And this month, we're going to be praying for Demir Splojaric. Uh, Demir is a Croatian. He uh, works and ministers there in Croatia. And if you want to find out more about Demir and the specific work he's doing, you can go to brcc.church/missions. And if you look there, 
or if you just go to brcc.church and, and click the missions tab, you can see that we have listed the missionary of the month, and it is Demir. You can read and learn about his work in Croatia. And I encourage you, as we always do, even though we're separated right now, we're in this time of quarantine, let's take the time to keep praying for our missionaries. God is still on mission. That has not changed. So friends, let's pray together. So we're going to take time now to pray for that. And then I'll also pray again regarding the situation with the coronavirus and uh, COVID-19. Father, we do come together right now to pray for your worldwide mission. Father, we're in times where the news is very concerned, and, and rightly so in many ways, Father, with what's going on with this coronavirus, the COVID-19 situation. But Father, your mission to reach out and to draw people from every tribe, every nation, every language, people group on this earth has not stopped, Lord. It's not been set aside. And so, Father, we join together as a church and we pray for Demir Splojaric and the work going on there in Croatia. Father, uh, there are not very many people in that country who have heard the fullness of your true gospel and who have responded with personal faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that perhaps as uh, they, like many people here in America, may be concerned and thinking about their own mortality. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be working through Demir and other believers there to reach out to them with the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that the hope of the gospel the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ would break through and that many of them might hear and respond to the good news. And Father, in that light, we also pray for this entire situation regarding the coronavirus. Father, of course, we, we begin by praying for you to bring an end to this modern day plague and pestilence. Lord, we pray for wisdom for our leaders, for President Trump and Speaker Pelosi, for Vice President Pence as he leads uh, the task force that's working with this. Father, we pray for uh, the leaders at the CDC. Uh, Father Dr. Fauci as he's leading the particular uh, work here in America. Lord, we pray for leaders around the globe that they would have wisdom. Father, that we would act wisely, uh, practicing the things that would bring health and healing. But Father, ultimately, we look to you. Father, we pray that you would give wisdom and revelation that uh, a cure to this virus could be found, Father, whether it's a vaccination or some current drugs. Father, we pray that there would be an end to this pestilence, that you would bring it to a close. But as well, Father, we pray that you would work good out of this. You are the God who even when Joseph's brothers meant evil, Joseph said that he trusted that you meant it for good. And so, Lord, in the midst of this time when so many are fearing, when there is so much questioning and, and wondering what's going on, Father, we pray that you would work good out of it. I pray, Father, we pray together that you would use this to cause people to hear the gospel. Cause them to understand the gospel. May your Holy Spirit open their eyes to see who Jesus is and what he has done. Not just in Croatia, as we prayed, Father, uh, but here in America, Lord, right here in the Annapolis area. And Father, we pray that it would happen around the globe. Father, what the enemy would mean to steal and kill and destroy through this plague would you use to bring many into true, abundant, eternal life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, everyone, to our online teaching at Bay Ridge Christian Church. It's great that even with a crazy pandemic, we can continue to meet and praise God and learn from His Word. And I know there are probably some folks out there listening in who aren't part of BRCC, maybe even some who aren't part of any local church and, and don't even know who this fellow named Jesus is that we Christians uh, make so much of. Well, I want to welcome you too. And, and please, uh, let me just ask that you hang in for the next 30 minutes or so. And, and let me say to you, I believe that will be worth your while. So let me pray and, and we'll jump right in. 
I pray, oh God, please don't let me mess this up. For the next 30 minutes, Lord, be with me, inspire me. No matter what else, Father, I get wrong today or, or this week, help me not to get this wrong. Help me to diminish that praise and worship and faith in you would increase. Amen. Today, we're going to deal with the most important issue you will ever face. Because if Jesus is who he said he is, if, if he's the Jesus we Christians believe in, then how you respond to him will be the most important thing you ever do in your entire life. It's not an easy decision. You, you and I and everybody have a huge conflict of interest in deciding because if you confront it honestly, it will change everything. This is a decision you want to really think through. Look, if, if you've decided you don't believe, that's your choice. But, but please, you owe it to yourself to make sure you know what you're not believing in. You owe it to yourself to make sure you don't believe because you've thought about it, wrestled with it, and, and you've made a fully informed decision not to believe. Because if there is a God and he's like the God of the Bible, if he's like Jesus, then everything changes. Today is Palm Sunday on the Christian calendar. It's the first day of the week before Jesus goes to the cross. It's the Sunday before Easter Sunday. Christians sometimes call it Jesus' triumphal entry because it's akin to the triumphant entry great kings and warriors staged when they return from victory in battle. Jews will recognize it because it's the Sunday before the Passover feast. Passover was the celebration of the deliverance of the Jews from, from a bondage in, in Egypt through 10 plagues. Maybe with a novel coronavirus sweeping the earth, that makes this Palm Sunday and, and this Passover even more relevant. Tradition also tells us that it was on this Sunday, the, the Sunday before Passover started, that Jewish families would select the lamb they would sacrifice for the Passover meal. Uh, I'm going to read the account of that first Palm Sunday from the book of Matthew, from, uh, from Matthew um, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. As I was preparing for today's sermon, I, I watched a lot of pastors give a, a lot of past Palm Sunday sermons, and, and there are a lot of them out there. And, and there are sermons on just about every aspect of Palm Sunday. I even ran across a number of, uh, of sermons that considered Palm Sunday from the perspective of the donkey uh, Jesus was riding on. They were mostly about what the donkey must have thought if donkeys could think about such things. Look, I get it. Most uh, people who sit through a sermon want to hear something mildly entertaining and maybe get a new insight or, or twist on something they thought they already knew. And that gets hard for a professional pastor who has to give a fresh Easter sermon every year or a new perspective on Christmas. My guess is that about 10 years in, it, it starts getting hard to find something new to talk about. But since this is my first Palm Sunday sermon, that's not going to be a problem for me. Anything I say is going to be new, at least new to me. So rather than try to find a, a new twist, we're just going to talk about some of the basics, like what in the world is going on here? Most importantly, I'd like to try to answer the question our text says the whole city asked. It's the central question of all the New Testament. Who is this? That's the question, is it not? Who is this Jesus? Everyone then and now has an opinion. 
In Matthew 19, Jesus says, some people called him a, a glutton and a drunkard. Over and over in the New Testament, the, the religious authorities say he's a friend of tax collectors and, and sinners. He's a blasphemer. In John 10, 20, we find some thought Jesus was possessed by a demon and raving mad. Uh, for this group of people, the, the question wasn't, who is this? It was, who does this Jesus think he is? They, they were full of contempt and scorn. Th this group of people weren't waving palm branches. They were plotting Jesus' death. Uh, also in that shouting crowd were people for whom Christ had worked miracles, restored their sight, healed their bodies, uh, freed their minds from possession. John tells us Lazarus was there, who, who Jesus had raised from the dead, and friends of Lazarus who had seen him do it. Many of those people were probably adding their hosannas and praises. Others were probably part of this group sincerely asking, who is this? Jesus asked his disciples shortly before entering Jerusalem the same thing. Who do people say I am? His disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus asks, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responds by telling Peter he's been blessed because God the Father has revealed this to him. The donkey confirms Peter's response, not in the way some have spoken about the donkey, not in what the donkey thought of the Messiah riding him. After all, the donkey's not talking, but in the reason for a donkey in the first place. Why a donkey? Go get a donkey? Why a donkey? A donkey's a fairly ridiculous way to travel, is it not? We find the answer in a, in a book written more than 500 years earlier, and it gives us a powerful indication of who this Jesus is. In the Old Testament, in Zechariah chapter 2 and chapter 9, Zechariah gives his readers two reasons to rejoice. Here in Zechariah 10, I'm sorry, Zechariah 2, verses 10 to 11, shout and be glad. Daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Maybe you notice that the speaker of these verses isn't Zechariah. It's the Lord who declares he's coming. He will live among you. But then he says, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This happens all over the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's startling that we're constantly confronted by more than one divine person called the Lord. Over and over in the Old Testament, in Judges, in Genesis, in Numbers, in Job, it's all over the place in Psalms. Here is light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, as the Nicene Creed puts it. This is the Lord Christ. And in Zechariah 2, he's speaking about how he would dwell in the midst of the people and, and, and he would join them to his Father, the Lord Almighty. In Zechariah 9.9, he's back. And here, Zechariah tells us how we will recognize the Lord when he comes. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Here is the Lord Christ. In Zechariah 2, he talks of dwelling with his people, that he would join them to his father, the Lord Almighty. Now in Zechariah 9, he talks of peace, taking away the chariots and war horses and proclaiming peace. Kings rode donkeys as a sign of peace. In times of war, kings and warlords ride a horse. In the book of Revelation, when Jesus returns to judge the earth, he comes riding on a horse. But here in Zechariah, the Lord is offering terms of peace. And Zechariah is saying we know that because he comes riding on a donkey. Look again at how Zechariah 9.9 9 puts it. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey.
They called it the triumphal entry to compare it with the triumphal entry of Roman kings returning from war to accept honor and praise. And Christ accepts the honor and praise of the crowd on Palm Sunday. But Christ's triumph is very different than those Roman kings. His entry is very different. For a start, he uses a very different method of transportation that radically subverts people's expectations of a, of a king. He does not ride into town on a mighty war horse. He is the king, but he's not that kind of king. He's the lowly king, and he comes on a donkey. It's a weird juxtaposition, isn't it? Righteous and victorious, lowly and humble. Look, you can't treat Jesus like other kings because Jesus' kingdom doesn't operate the same way theirs does. It doesn't operate on force or pride or, or wealth. It operates on mercy. He turns our understanding of what's strong and right on its head, and he does exactly what we don't expect he'll do. Just before Jesus enters Jerusalem, we learn more about what this looks like from Jesus himself. Look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28. Let me set this up first. Jesus is traveling with the 12, and he, and he tells them they're going to Jerusalem. He, he's ready to make his grand entry. And then he adds that he's going to be arrested and mocked and flogged and condemned to death. He, he's going to be crucified. Now, I don't know, maybe they were so excited about Jesus going to Jerusalem that they missed the part about his being captured and tortured and, and killed. In fact, John and James seem to think this is a good time to jostle ahead of the others and vie for the top spots when Jesus takes the throne. Uh, understandably, when the other ten find out about John and James' political machinations, they get angry. <laughs> how, does this, how, how does Jesus respond? W with a very compassionate come-to-Jesus meeting. Matthew tells us about it in chapter 20, verses 25 to 28. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We constantly worry about our position, especially as it relates to one another. We, we know deep down I, I'm not okay, but so long as I'm better than him or getting more than her, things aren't so bad. We, we work intensively to get ahead of the next person, constantly defining our own self-value against how we perceive others. A German psychologist named Stefan Steiger conducted a research project last year for the, uh, for the journal Frontiers in Psychology. And in it, Steiger um, interviewed both regular social media users and people who didn't use social media at all. And I don't mean to reduce Steiger's report to a, a soundbite here because it's quite comprehensive, but what Steiger found was, was that frequent social media users very often suffered less satisfaction with their lives than people who weren't involved with social media at all. And even more, he found that the more friends you had on Facebook, the less likely you were to be satisfied with your own life. The study also found that quitting social media for a week significantly increased people's psychological well-being. Why? Because people get depressed when they see everyone else posting all those happy photos, fancy meals, intimate moments with their friends and family. People become dissatisfied with their own lives. How come my puppy isn't that adorable? Why don't I have romantic dinners every night? Where's my boat, my beach house? Or equally destructive, we justify ourselves and say, well, at least I'm better than him. I deserve more recognition than her. Uh, we, we keep an anxious eye on our own status and on everyone else's, and we get unhappy or angry or depressed if someone else gets ahead or if we fall behind. And, and so back and forth we go between dissatisfaction, envy, and resentment on the one hand and pride and self-justification on the other. Then, while we jostle to get ahead, 
the, the judge of the world shows up and flips everything upside down. He, he says, whoever wants to be great has to be a servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Jesus turns everything inside out, and it's a stab right through our envy, our, our greed, our dissatisfaction, our complaint. It's the murder of all of our attempts to justify ourselves. While we shove our way to first place, Jesus shows up in last place. He, he shows up at the bottom of the heap, the lowest of the low, where he slaves and he suffers and he bleeds and he dies and he descends into infinite hell to pay the price for infinite sin. And then out of the valley of the shadow of death, he ascends as our once and only king. The last becomes first. The, the slave becomes Lord. The people of Zechariah's day would never see the coming king that Zechariah wrote about. He, he took 500 years to come. But on that first Palm Sunday, it all comes about exactly as Zechariah foretold it would. Remember what we said earlier? If Jesus is who he says he is, he, he not only knows Zechariah's scripture, he's the very same one who spoke those words through Zechariah 500 years earlier. Your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. Who is this? He's your humble-hearted Lord God Almighty. Consider the shouts of the crowd. Hosanna means save us. And Jesus has indeed come to save them, but not in the way they expected. Not to rid them of Romans, but to be killed by Romans. Not to sit on a throne, but to be nailed to a cross. Not to wear a crown of gold, but to wear a crown of thorns. Unlike the triumphal entry of Roman generals, Jesus is not returning from battle. <laughs> He's headed to his death. And at least some of those present on that Sunday who, who cried Hosanna will scream a few days later, crucify him. Jesus knows this is what awaits him, yet, yet he rides on. He, he knows he'll be betrayed, arrested, tortured, and crucified, yet he rides on. If the crowd had known their scripture as well as Jesus, they too might have seen what was coming. That the crowd would cry out, Hosanna, save us. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We're all predicted, just like the roll of the donkey hundreds of years earlier. It's Psalm 118. I'll read from the English Standard Version because I think it, it makes it a little clear what's going on. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The blessed one is the coming one. Yeah, he, he comes in the name of the Lord. But where is he coming to? Here in the Palm Sunday procession, we see the welcoming ceremony, but it's not just praisers who are there. There are also the grumblers, the ones who uh, don't say, who is this? They say, who does he think he is? The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the temple magistrates, they're all there. And they, and they greet Jesus from the house of the Lord, the temple. But when they take hold of him, what do they do? Psalm 118 tells us, they bind the sacrifice with ropes and take it up to the horns of the altar. And so the lowly king of Ezekiel 9 who rides in on a donkey is also the human sacrifice taken up to the altar in Psalm 118. This was the central mission of Jesus on earth. Remember Ezekiel chapter 2? He, he was to join his people to his father, the Lord God Almighty. This is the meekness of our Lord, a king who is known in sacrifice, a God who is so determined to win our hearts, he will ride to his own execution. Nothing stops him. Nothing slows him. He'll ride on for people who mock him with insincere praise one day, but howl for his blood just a few days later. This is the God of Scripture. Who is this? This is Jesus Christ, the God-man, the great king of the universe who makes his triumphal procession not on a stallion with sword drawn, but on a lowly donkey to rescue you and me by dying in our place. So how do we apply the lesson of Palm Sunday? Well, first, 
What's important to you? Are you struggling to get to the top? Do you compare yourself to others only to find you're disappointed that you don't have a better life, more romance, a nicer vacation house? Or do you justify yourself by thinking, well, at least I'm better than him? And are you finding all of that envy and self-justification only leads to further dissatisfaction? What do you do? In Matthew uh, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Jesus tells us exactly what to do. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's saying, Give up the striving, give up the self-justification, give up the envy and the greed and the selfishness. Look instead to him, the lowly and humble king who comes to serve. Don't you see you're never going to find satisfaction comparing yourself to others? Your, your deepest needs are only ever going to be met by Jesus Christ. First, that your life matters, that you're important, your life has meaning. And second, that you're loved. Loved beyond anything you can hope or understand. Loved even though you know you're deeply flawed. Even though you're not who you want to be. That's the kind of love Jesus offers. From Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Next, who are you in the story of Jesus' triumphal entry? Are you one of those cheering disciples who shout, save us, blessed is the Lord? Or are you one of those who honestly asks, who is this? Or are you one of those who sneers, who does this man think he is? There are only one of two ways to respond to Jesus Christ. There are those who shout, Hosanna, save us. Those who bow down before the king and submit who love and honor and praise Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And then there are those who cry, crucify him. Which one are you? And finally, who do you say Jesus Christ is? If you're watching and you don't know the answer to that question, I urge you to cry out now. Ask Jesus for his guidance. Ask for clarity. Remember how we started today? How you respond to Jesus is the most important question you'll ever have to deal with in your life. I know a lot of people today say they love Jesus' great teachings, his moral lessons, his focus on social justice. Well, I'm sorry, but if you don't know Jesus as your Redeemer and your King, then you don't love his teachings or his morality or his social justice. You see, if God isn't God of the entire universe, then there is no moral code. There, there is no definite right, no definite wrong. Everything is chemistry. Everything is an accident. There is no reason. There is no morality. There is no social justice. But if Jesus is king of the cosmos as he claims, if as Colossians says, he created all things and, and he holds all things together by the power of his word, then of course there's order. And only then is love real, because only the God of the Bible creates out of an overflowing of love. Chemistry is only chemistry. It can't make love real. But the Bible says God is love. And it's out of that love that God creates. And Jesus, and King Jesus has come to unite us with the, with the Father, bring us into that circle of love between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yes, Jesus is the king of the cosmos. And objectively speaking, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you care or not, Jesus is the creator of all things and all things are held together by his word. But Jesus isn't just king of all creation. He, he can also be your king, the king of your life, the king of your heart. To the degree Jesus is the king of your life, then your life will be full. In him, you'll hold together not by your own power, but by the power of his word. If he can hold everything in the universe together by the power of his word, don't you think he can hold your life together? It doesn't mean the storms won't come. They will. You'll get sick. You'll lose your job. You'll be betrayed by a friend. But if Jesus is the king of your life, then you won't be destroyed. You may be shaken, 
but you won't be forever ruined or, or destroyed. And so if you don't know Jesus Christ as king, nothing is more important for you to think about. Nothing is more important for you to dwell on and consider. Nothing is more important for your future or your life, to, the life to come, than for you to make that decision. But what about those of us who claim we are believers? Are we treating Jesus as our king? I know many believers are indeed, and they're experiencing Christ's blessedness no matter the crisis that comes their way. But a lot of us aren't. We aren't submitting to him. We aren't obeying. Forgiveness always, truth always, don't envy, don't be bitter, turn the other cheek, never return evil for evil, but always return good for evil, always. We can't do any of these things perfectly, but do we even try? And when we fail, do we confess? Do we pray for forgiveness? And do we try again? Don't you see, if you say, I'll obey if, if he gives me the sexual partner I want, if he gives me the job I want, if he gives me the marriage or the income or the promotion or the, or the healing I want, then I'll obey, then I'll trust. Don't you see? You're not trusting him as king at all. You're trying to be the king, and you're asking Jesus to be your counselor, your cabinet minister in charge of good times. That's not who Jesus is. He, he's the king creator and redeemer of the universe. You have to submit to him. You, you have to, to say, not my will, but yours be done. That's how you find the joy and the happiness, the, the meaning you so desperately crave and need. It's the paradox we talked about earlier. If you want to be first, you have to be last. If you want to, be, if you want to save your life, you have to lose it. It's the meek, not the proud, who inherit. Do you treat Jesus as your king? Do you submit to him? Do you trust him? Or Here's another way to look at it. Do you, do you rely on him? Ha have you been so overwhelmed by the wonderful things he's done in your life that you've just come to expect even more wonderful things in the future? There's a place in John Newton's great hymn, uh, come my soul and uh, it, it says this thou art coming to a king uh, large petitions would thee bring for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much do you understand that for king jesus there there is no request too small or too large it's as easy for him to give you what you need as it is for bill gates to flip you a quarter but the difference is that jesus loves you he proved it by dying for you. And as Ezekiel told us he would, he's joined you with the Father. And so now when God looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. How much does God love his son? That's how much he loves you. How beautiful is Christ to the Father? That's how beautiful you are to the Father. You can love your king because you'll never match the love he's already shown you. Who do you say Jesus is? Anne Beshore is going to sing our closing song today, Lead Me to the Cross. Sing with Anne, will you? Ask Jesus to lead you to the cross. Whether you've been there before or it's your first time ever, there is no place more powerful to witness Jesus as King of life than at the foot of the cross where you see his life poured out for you. Thank you. Quiet my soul, remember Redemption's hill where your blood was spilled for my ransom. And everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. Were a 
as I tempted and tried. You little man, the word became flesh for my sin and death. Now you're Everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. Thanks to Ann Bashor who uh, did all the music today. What a what a wonderful blessing uh, that's been for us here on Palm Sunday. Um, really appreciate it, Ann. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to close us today with a prayer I found online from the Bulletin of the Rochester Christian Reformed Church. Uh, I think it perfectly sums up the way we should be thinking today and and throughout the week leading to Easter Sunday. Uh, loving God, you rode a rode a donkey and came in peace humbled yourself and gave yourself for us. Uh, we confess our lack of humility. As you entered Jerusalem, the crowd shouted, Hosanna, save us. On Good Friday, they shouted, crucify. We confess our praise is often empty. We sing Hosanna, but cry crucify. As the crowd laid their palms in front of you, you took the way of God. You took no glory for yourself. We confess that we want to be accepted and, and take the easy way. We do not stay true to your will. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to follow in the way of obedience. Amen. Our benediction today comes from the uh, English Standard uh, Version translation of, of um, Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, verse 18. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful and blessed week. Hopefully we'll be seeing each other soon in person. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>